One of the joys that I have had over the last 30 years is <clears throat> just to watch people come through our doors who might be a little rebellious towards God, a lot of different backgrounds, circumstances, baggage that they, they're carrying in, and uh, just watch God week after week just penetrate people's hearts and really, and really change their lives. And so life change is what Grace Church is all about. We love, we love, love, love to see people come through our doors or listen to our, our podcast and, uh, and have life change. So today what I want to talk about is how does, God, how does that happen? How does God change a life? Are there things that God uses to change a life? And I want to suggest to you that there are probably many ways that God changes his life. We're not just cookie cutter Christians. But the reality is there's always some, there's some ingredients that God always uses if he's going to change a life. So I want to suggest three of those things today. And I believe that if you'll listen carefully, these are ongoing things in our life. They're not one-time things. They're things that if you, my life isn't, hasn't been changed, it's being changed. It is being changed. It hasn't been. It is being. And I hope that's your testimony as well, that God is changing your life and every day you're moving closer to Jesus and every day you are finding and discovering the power of Christ for your life. So we're going to talk about that up close and personal, but before I get there, I need to tell you that no matter what God does, there's always a counterfeit to it. So I want to address the counterfeit for just a few minutes of how God changes life. This is how God doesn't change a life. This is the enemy's tools. So what I want to suggest to you is simply this. The counterfeit to a changed life is religion. It is religion. So let me just define for you what I mean by that. Let me define religion as man's attempt to reach to God. It's my, my attempt to find somehow, some way to please God. This happens through a variety of different ways, and, and most of the time the motives are absolutely pure. It's just that these are things that are counterfeit. Every time there's truth, there's counterfeit. So let me suggest to you that there are at least three or four things that, that uh, demonstrate a counterfeit methodology. First of all, um, sometimes we come through God through tradition. That somehow, some way, we have certain traditions in our life that we think somehow when we practice those traditions that somehow, some way, God is going to draw closer to us. And then sometimes we practice a counterfeit faith through legalism. And what I mean by that is somehow believing the lie that I can perform for God in a certain way that will cause him to, to smile on me, to give, me to give him pleasure. And I'm just simply saying is that it's not our work, it's his work. And legalism, and that is rules and regulations and disciplines, all those things can be beneficial in their right perspective. But the reality is, is that when they become the primary thing, the primary way I approach God, it's just counterfeit. And then oftentimes we don't have the humility that we need to with God. So we approach God from the standpoint of a prideful spirit, thinking somehow, some way that I deserve something from God, and that is, that's just pride. And probably one of the classic examples in all of the Bible of counterfeit religion, we go back into the Old Testament and we discover in Genesis this idea of people gathering together to build this tower unto heaven, the Tower of Babel. And in that tower, uh, God comes down. You know the story more than likely. You've been taught the story before or heard the story. God comes down and confounds the languages. And what God is doing is something very significant because here was the heart of the lie that they were believing. They were believing the lie that somehow and in some way that they could reject God's current revelation and live out their own. And that's where all false religion starts, by the way. It's rejecting what God has already revealed to us and accepting something new or building something new. So now let's go back to the story. Let's go back to the idea of how then does God actually change a life in the context of, everyday, of, of an everyday world. I think there are three things that God uses to change our lives. The first one is this. And this is a universal principle that God, God removes the blindness from our eyes and from our hearts. When you were born into this world, listen to me very carefully, you're not the exception. 
you were born blinded to the things of God without the capability of seeing spiritual matters. You had eyes, but you could not see. If you read the Gospels, you'll see that all the time. Jesus talks about this concept all the way through the Gospels. The truth is, is there is an enemy out there and he has a strategy, and that strategy hasn't changed for thousands and thousands of years. And here's the, here's the strategy. It's found for us in 2 Corinthians. Paul's writing to the Corinthian believers, chapter number 4, verse 4, and this is what it said. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. That's why oftentimes... Uh, you look around and you think, gosh, the gospel is such good news. Think about that. The gospel is such great news. The fact is, is that I can go to heaven, that I can be with God, that I can have all of my sins paid for, that I don't have to live with condemnation, that I don't have to live with the fear of wondering where I stand with God. All that is great news. And you're wondering, why wouldn't anybody want to hear that news? And the answer to that question is, is they're blinded. They're just blinded to the truth of what God has. And before those of us that have found faith in Christ get too prideful, let me just simply say this is an ongoing issue oftentimes in our life that we might see the gospel clearly, but maybe there's other things that we're just blinded to. So that we have to have the humility in our life of trusting in God's revelation to us and understanding that there's a tactic against us and what Satan wants, us, wants to happen in our life is he wants to blind us. I was watching TV last night, and I was just sad. And I was watching people take bats and bash windows out and, and, uh, and do destructive things and say destructive words to people who are just trying to serve our city. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, well, why would they do that? And, you know, my, I, I was starting to get angry at it, and I was starting to, my blood pressure was rising a little bit. And then I realized, wait a second here, time out, Dan. It's because of the blindness of their heart. Is there things that they cannot see? They cannot see that hate will never win. That's blindness. That's just a blind, that's an issue of blindness. And so as you think about that, Think about the tactical elements of warfare. Did you know, you, some of you probably are a lot smarter than me about this, but uh, there are actually laser weapons that, that uh, countries have that their purpose is to blind the enemy, and there's actually some rules and regulations of how to use those in international law. There's a, couple, you know, there's a, a few countries that don't abide to international law. I, I never thought I'd be talking about strategy of, of war, but but when you think about that, listen carefully, Satan has a strategy, and that strategy is very carefully laid out. It makes a lot of sense that a soldier doesn't have to be destroyed in order to render them inoperative. Think about that as it relates to spiritual life. Satan doesn't have to destroy your life. He just has to blind your life so that you can't see with the eyes of God. You can't see this world with the eyes of God. Of God. So my hope and prayer is that you will, first of all, pray for your own life. God, please remove any blindness that I have in my own life. Let me see my neighbor as you see them. Let me see the world as you see it. Let me see myself as you see me. And then for those of you that have lost friends, people that are just out there that don't know Jesus yet, I hope that your primary prayer for them would simply be this. Lord, please remove the veil in their eyes that they might see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So what I've watched and what I've noticed is that all of a sudden, people who are walking one direction make a turnaround in the last 30 years, and the reason they make a turnaround isn't because they have an amazing pastor writing. Everybody's going to say amen to that. And, uh, but it's because God intersects their life. God intersects their life, and he removes the blindness from their eyes so that they can see and hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the reason, that's the method that God uses to change a life. The second method that God uses is that he delivers us from the power and penalty of sin. And this is found for us in the book of Ephesians. And this is what Ephesians says, chapter 1, verse 7. He is so rich. Can I get an amen to that? He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave 
forgave our sins, all of them. He forgave all of our sins. But just like there's a counterfeit religion, there's a counterfeit thought of forgiveness here. So I want to I dig deeper in this because the reality is, is that I don't go to heaven. I cannot go to heaven. I cannot have a, the hope of eternal life. I cannot experience the good life until I understand the nature of how God dispenses forgiveness in my life. This is so important. So let me see if I can explain it by an illustration. In Ontario, Canada, Canada p- police are still looking for a remorseful thief who tried to atone for his bad actions. This is what happened. This is the story. So he breaks into a house. He's, he's destitute. He has nothing. He needs food. He breaks into a house and uh, he steals some stuff to sell. He breaks a window and st- messes up their floor. And, you know, he goes out and, and as it would happen... He decides that this wasn't really a very good plan. So the very next night, he goes back to the same house and he takes all the stolen items that he had and he places them on the doorstep, but there was a letter that he had left at the doorstep of this house. And this is so telling and it has so much to do with how God relates to us. So let me just read the letter to you. This is what it says. Dear family, I have wronged you. I am the one who have committed these serious crimes against your family, and I want, you, I want to apologize from the bottom of my heart. I was, it was nothing personal. I didn't go through any of your uh, personal belongings. I've been having a very hard time financially lately, and I made the worst mistake of my life. I would also commit to at least 15 hours of community service to partially help atone for what I have done. So let me just simply say there's a couple things wrong with this letter. First of all, as we approach God, we don't defend ourselves. We don't say, I'm on hard times here. The reason, I, the reason that I do this is because I do that, or this has happened in my life. That's ludicrous. We have to own everything that we do. The second thing that you have to understand is God is not looking for an apology from you. He's just not. You know, I, I, it's great. I mean, I think it's awesome that someone feels bad or feels badly that they have committed atrocities against God himself and that that is the byproduct of a, of a life that is being changed there's no question about that but the reality is is that I don't actually get my sins forgiven until I embrace the cross it's not that I feel bad for my sins and I just say oh God I slipped up there sorry I said a bad word God I'm sorry I'm so sorry I offended you God that's not how it works it's when I spiritually speaking get off the couch and I embrace what Christ did for me on Calvary when he went to that cross when he emptied himself of the right to be regarded as God when he took on the form of a servant when he went to the cross willingly and when the father unleashed his wrath upon his son that was the payment that was made and until I see that with my heart until I understand that I've got to embrace that I've got to I've got to realize that somebody else atoned for my sin and there is nothing that I can do. I can't return the goods back. I can't take anything back. I can't take a life back. All I can do is throw myself at the mercy of God. So the way that God changes a life is he begins to reveal the truth of the cross. And once I understand the cross and my responsibility towards that cross is I can't be passive The cross is not a passive thing. I've got to either reject it or receive it. And if I receive it, it means that I throw myself at God's mercy and I trust that what Christ did on that cross was exactly what God the Father needed to pay for all my sins. I can't pay for them. I can't atone. I just simply cannot atone for my sins. I have to trust that Jesus' blood was enough to forgive all my sins. Oftentimes, I, get, I have people come to my office, well, not recently, but back in the old day, I had people come to my office and they would say things to me like, Pastor Dan, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. And I go, really? What is it? Because I'm really curious. I want to know because I, I don't want to commit it, right? I'm just kidding. I, I'm, I'm just kidding about that. And I'm thinking, well, what, it, you know, and I ask them, what do you think the unpardonable sin is? And I'll oft, they'll, you know, it's A to Z from people. And I'm going, you know, the only sin that God won't forgive 
is for you re to reject the work that Jesus did on the cross. That's the only unpardonable sin. It isn't anything else. And fact is, is that and this I just kind of smile at them and in a Pastor Dan kind, gentle way. And I say, by the way, you are committing a sin right now because you're undervaluing the blood of Jesus by even thinking that you've committed an unpardonable sin. So what did Jesus die for? If there was something the cross, if there was something the cross wouldn't pay for, what would Jesus have to die for? If it was Christ plus me? I mean, that's not a good formula, right? I'm all messed up. It's Christ plus nothing. It's Christ alone. And when that comes on, when the lights come on that it's Christ alone, I'm telling you, it changes life. An apology doesn't change anything. The fact that crime has to be paid for. Christ paid for your crime. And when that, when that, that is opened up, I'm telling you, when, that, when your heart is opened up to that truth, it is life-changing, it's game-changing. And then when that happens... There's a third thing that happens that is also just as life-changing. And, and these are in that order. God removes the blindness from my eyes. I see the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross, for what it really is. I see that. And then when I get up off of my knees, my first desire is to love God with all my heart, mind, and soul and to serve him all the days of my life. So the third of in, ingredient here is that God, in, God empowers us once we've had that revelation from him. He empowers us, us to serve him. Do you remember John chapter 13? When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, you know the story? He's about ready to die. He's about, he knows, his, his, no, his, knows his, his ministry on earth is finished. And now he's just a few details to take care of. So they go up into an upper room. And uh, in that culture, in that day, they would walk around in sandals. And normally what would happen is there would be somebody at the door that would be the person who would wash everybody's feet. Because there was a lot of germs. Because they, because they walked on, on garbage all day long. And so on that particular evening, there was nobody to wash anybody, any, anybody's feet. And so Jesus strips himself down to the garments of a servant and one by one, one by one, individually comes and washes all of the disciples' feet. And then in John chapter 13, this is what he says. Listen to what he says to them. Do you understand what I, what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I am your Lord and teacher, I have washed your feet. You ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example to follow and then here's the command. Here's the command. Do, not just an example here, do as I have done to you. The command is, is that I'm supposed to be washing other people's feet. Now let's translate that into 21st century America. So whose feet should I wash? That's a great question. Then the answer is anybody that comes across your path. Say, do I have to, do I have to go to the church to serve Jesus? No. All you have to do is drive through your neighborhood and open up your eyes and look for opportunities to wash someone's feet. And I don't think this is something that translates well into 21st century America. I, washing people's feet or simply in 21st century America is taking care of the jobs that nobody else wants to do. Are you too good for that? Because maybe if that's the case, you don't, under, you don't understand what God has done for you. I mean, serving one another is such a powerful thing for you to do. Several women, women were visiting an el elderly friend, and she was very ill, and so they came and visited with her for a few minutes, and they were getting ready to leave. And uh, they said to her, uh, we'll, we'll keep you in our prayers. I mean, you probably said that to someone too. We'll keep you in our prayers. And this very ill woman said this, just wash the dishes in the kitchen. I can do my own praying. That's what washing people's feet is. That's what it is. It's just simply looking around and seeing what needs to be done and just doing it. Toward the end of his life, Albert Einstein removed two portraits from his house. One was of Newton and the other one was uh, Maxwell. They were both scientists and he replaced them with portraits of Gandhi and Schweitzer. 
And this is why he said he did it. He explained it was time to replace the image of success with the image of service. So let me ask you this question. Do you want to be a servant or do you want to be seen as successful? Because they're not always together. Sometimes you have to make a choice of whether you want to be a servant or you want to have the image of success on your life. You see, the truth is, is that people who know Jesus, smile at me when I say this, people who know Jesus get in the game. And if you have no desire to get in the game, I'm going to say something very hard right now. Listen to me very carefully. If you have no desire to get in the game, it might evidence the fact that you never were in the family. Because people who are in the family want to be in the game. So I'm just simply saying, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Write your emails to me. I'm lonely, so uh, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. So to wash someone's feet, you don't have to go very far. Maybe it's to your next door neighbor. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. It's anywhere you have, you can see people with needs. So I want to just end our time together with an invitation for you. And maybe, maybe you have been blind to the gospel. Maybe you have not understood the cross, that it's paid for all of your sins. And maybe you have just never joined the family and got in the game. I want to give you an invitation right now. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes right where you're at with no one looking around. And I want to just talk with you. And I want to lead you in a prayer that I believe is going to be life-changing. So would you pray with me a prayer that would go like this? Dear Father, remove the blindness from my eyes and from my heart that I might see the glorious gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for my sins, that his blood is sufficient for all of my sins, past, present, and future. I pray that you would open my eyes that I might receive your kindness and your grace right now and that you would put me in the game, that you would just Allow me, the spirit that says, I don't care whose feet they are, if there's a need, I'm going to wash them. That's what children of God do. So if you prayed that prayer with me just now, and you've invited Christ to apply his blood to your life, that you've received Christ as your only salvation, your only hope, I want you to look in my, in, in my eyes right now, I want you to look up and look at me and look in my eyes. Let me just say, you've made the most important decision of your life. There's nothing more important than your eternity. Let's not get this wrong. It's through the death of Jesus. It's through the glorious gospel that you were saved. And it only happens when God removes your blindness. May you now, may you now live with the idea that every day, my job description as a believer is to do exactly what Jesus told me to do, and that is to wash one another's feet. And I know that if you, as you live that way, that you will live right in the center of God's will. So I want to just ask you to do one more thing. I want everyone uh, hearing my voice, looking at me today, I want you to stand up right now. If you're able, I want you to stand up right now. And uh, I want I want to give you just a moment to respond to this amazing grace that God has given you. This amazing, this amazing adoption that he has given you from a child of the devil to becoming a child of God. That, my friend, is amazing. So just take a moment and just respond in any way you, seem, you think is, is fitting to the great news of the gospel of Jesus.